public outreach, giving a general idea of that. You know, we're talking about going out, working with groups, uh, educational, uh, content specific areas. Um, there's, of course, a lot of work in uh, the fields of archaeology, of course, using physical geography to get out there. Um, but basically trying to work with groups to help bolster their understanding of geography as they're doing some research. Informal education, museums, um, again, there's more and more of these uh, private institutions that are trying to put out more informal learning opportunities, especially in the digital uh, domain. But really one of the biggest things that we're facing with this and kind of a, an internal crisis that we have a lot of times whenever we're trying to create some of this material for informal education or for outreach is how do we sit down and talk more about the geography. So not focus as much on the content or at least supporting the content more with our ideas of talking about geography. So getting at those spatial thinking skills uh, while still supporting the details of the content, getting to those geographic uh, and geospatial capabilities while still making sure that people walk out understanding the general ideas of what we're talking about. So if we're talking about something like an archaeology outreach, you know, showing them how to use a GPS, but at the same time showing them how knowing where something is is going to be relevant in the larger research or activities that they're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so, as I've been saying, field work is a, a big way to try to uh, encourage people to understand geography. It's a lot easier sometimes to get those geographic ideas, those spatial thinking concepts out there if you actually people, put people in the field uh, actually doing those things, using the technologies like GPS. So sending them out to do geocaching, sending them out to um, collect data, bringing it back, working together. Um, you might have a few different content experts, someone who is specifically a geomorphologist, someone who's an archaeologist, someone who is a, uh, a geologist who can talk about different materials that they saw in the field, but at the same time bringing in someone who's a geographer to help bring together uh, all this information. Because, uh, of course, geography is very good at this holistic uh, way of presenting and understanding data, especially with the technologies that we've been using over the last few years. But these technologies go beyond just web mapping, GIS, GPS, and go even into uh, the newer technologies, new media that I've talked about a few times over the last couple of years. Um, there's a variety of blogs, of podcasts, of uh, social networking tools like Twitter and Facebook where we're talking about these types of information. And while we talk about them amongst, our, amongst ourselves, we're creating a repository, an archive of a great wealth of information uh, about our field uh, from projects that have been done that we can use as case studies to uh, details about how to have best practices. So if we're talking about something like uh, the Got GeoInt uh, website, we can of course talk about how geointelligence and the construction of information and knowledge from geospatial technologies is important. Uh, things like the uh, Neo New Geography blog, which really talks more about uh, urbanism and geography and how we are um, changing in those areas that we uh, are moving forward in. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different resources out there that we can really take advantage of. So podcasts. How many of you listen to podcasts, watch podcasts? So a few of you. Uh, it's a thing that, uh, of course, has been around for a while. Uh, it's simply uh, time shifting, location shifting information. But at the same time, whenever you're talking about audio podcasts, it's things that you can do in the background of some other activity. Whenever you're talking about video podcasts, of course, it's a little more uh, attached. You have to uh, spend a little more time with it uh, to see what's going on. But there's a lot of great information from uh, things like Directions Magazine to the podcast I'm involved with, Very Spatial, where we're creating, again, these archives of information uh, sometimes very business specific for uh, the example of directions, very um, generalized geography and GIS for our podcast. But it's materials that uh, faculty uh, from K through 12, even up into undergraduate levels are using in their classroom to be able to support, well, whenever they're off at a conference, giving a student a podcast to listen to or a video to watch while they're gone. Uh, blogs, again, very important nowadays because they're not just a way for someone to get their own opinion out there. Of course, you have that whole citizen journalism aspect that's been going on 
and discussed for the last uh, six years or so. But more than that, it's really become this kickoff point for conversations. Nowadays, someone puts up a blog post. It doesn't. We don't wait for uh, the comment system to catch up with the people who are talking about it. We post the link to uh, Twitter. Suddenly, there's a whole conversation surrounding this uh, this article if people are interested in it. And so it's really becoming more of this interactive way of discussing things. While you can say something lengthy on the blog post, it very quickly becomes a, ver uh, a very dynamic conversation many times uh, in the Twitter sphere. Is that what we're calling it now, Twitter sphere? That's what I'm going to call it today. Um, and how many of you are, are using Twitter? About two of you at least. Oh, four, actually. Uh, and how many of you uh, actively read blogs? So most of you. So it really is becoming more and more a way of uh, consuming information. And with uh, especially the technology end of our, our area of understanding, uh, trying to wait for uh, publications to get new information out there, or uh, whenever you find out something small that will help a lot of people, which isn't necessarily journey, journal um, level, it's a very quick way to get it out there. It's a very rapid way to update it. And you don't have to wait for that uh, long-term um, one-year to three-year process that we have to wait for with the uh, with articles. So they really have provided a new way to share information. So these new media, blogs, podcasts, Twitter, Facebook, uh, et cetera, really try to, uh, or not try to, but have become our social network whenever we can't be at a conference. There's 7,000 of us here. We're going to talk maybe to 100 different people while we're here of those 7,000. So clearly, we're not going to be able to have that uh, very strong dynamic. We're going to uh, most of the time be talking to them uh, one to one or one to uh, room. Whereas with things like Twitter, things like Facebook, blog comments, you can open up a conversation to a much wider group of individuals. So whenever we're dealing with this, we have you know the ability to aggregate information. Uh, it is definitely social in nature and has very much become interactive over the last few years. How many of you who do uh, read blogs or, or listen to podcasts actually use uh, RSS feeders to bring in your content? So about half of the ones who are using blogs and podcasts. So uh, whenever you yourself are using these type of technologies, uh, RSS, really simple syndication, uh, is a publishing format that most blogs and podcasts uh, prevent or provide their information through so that you can uh, subscribe to it, bring it down into a piece of software so that you don't spend half of your day typing in one URL after another to try to get all of the pieces of information you're trying to get to. But instead, you can pull it into things like Google Reader. If you're on an iPad or an iPod, uh, you have lots of different uh, readers that'll bring the information in all at the same time um, and really does make it a lot easier to aggregate this information, pull it down, and again, like I was talking about before with the Twitter and uh, interaction and Facebook interaction, it's much more social. Now, the example I'm going to be talking about today uh, is a, a grant-based project that I'm working on for the North Carolina Space Grant Consortium, uh, where um, I'm looking at trying to um, present information about Earth observation to basically middle school and high school with possibility of undergraduate as well. <clears throat> the work is uh, kind of coming together at this point right now and because of some battles I'm having on campus to get server space, uh, some of the examples that I wanted to give in terms of the web maps I'm putting together uh, aren't available uh, just yet. But it's coming together. Uh, the podcast portion of it is online now is at observingtheearth.com. Uh, the first episode is there. But it's about uh, looking at, for the first 10 episodes at least that are sponsored by the grant, looking at sensors, uh, especially of course NASA-based sensors since that's where most of the funding is coming from, um, and trying to convey how those are being used to capture the Earth uh, and share that information through these uh, 6th to 12th graders. Um, as part of this, we're putting together brief hybrid workshops to go along with each of the videos so that whenever um, high school and middle school teachers come in, they can sit down, get a general idea of what they're looking at, have some questions to ask themselves as they're watching it, and then kind of follow up questions as well to ask themselves after they've seen the, the video. 
um, lesson plans that they can then use for their students, uh, creating data packages for them to use if they do have things like ArcGIS or our RCS Explorer, um, any of the free software packages. And again, we're working towards um, creating a web map system so that we can provide the teachers who want to use this a virtual laboratory, essentially, uh, where they can have access to this remote sensing data and uh, GIS data as well. And so again, the goal is to help students and teachers of students um, become more familiar with the Earth observation instruments we have out there right now. Everything from Landsat uh, all the way through to SPOT and um, the IRS satellites. So while the focus really is, of course, on the U.S. because of the granting, we really are going to try to um, have that uh, moderate, high, and low resolution um, satellite systems all the way through there. Um, and again, just a couple of slides. Uh, this is the brief hybrid workshop. Um, it's kind of this concept that is coming together where you have a five-minute video and you build content around this video that faculty and, and uh, teachers can use, um, lesson plans that they can u then use. You know, they will have the access to the data. They'll have access to the web maps uh, once they're up. Uh, and they can actually sit down with students and help them work through uh, this to again, really focus on spatial thinking uh, through different examples. So the, common, the, the first 10 uh, podcasts are going to be a combination of these very detailed um, information pieces about sensors. Then we're going to roll over to uh, a few case studies from North Carolina specifically, and then round it out with a couple of uh, more broader, these are how you see remote sensing in the news type of information. Um, we're kind of basing this on four eyes, uh, basically getting students to come up with ideas from what they're seeing in these videos and with the data they're, they're dealing with, uh, beginning to uh, actually go through and investigate the information. This, of course, is where the data and the uh, web maps come together. Be able to implement their own ideas. Again, whenever you have the newer web map technologies or access to some GIS software, they can actually fairly easily pick it up. A lot of times, the students pick it up much more quickly than the uh, faculty do or, or uh, teachers do. And then, of course, immerse themselves, hopefully, um, as groups working on this, uh, these different data sets that we're going to provide them. And so what we have, then, is uh, kind of this position of we should really try to take advantage of this information that's out there, and then an example of uh, one set of information, both podcast, blog, uh, and data, that can be used by teachers uh, in service, and of course, from basically sixth grade all the way up to 16th. So uh, 